Okay, let's have prayer together and we'll begin. Now, our Father, we thank you once again for meeting us here. We thank you for the Word of God and the faithfulness, Lord, of, uh, of the Word, Lord, that we can look to it and recognize truth and discern between truth and error. And Lord, we pray, our Heavenly Father, that we might see uh, a fresh glimpse of the Lord Jesus this night as we talk about His kingdom and Lord, just bless this time together. Give a sweet time of fellowship in the Word and build us up in the most holy faith. Ground us in your Word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, the, um, we begin with the uh, Kingdom Age. You remember on our outline, which um, everybody here should have memorized by now, the uh, introduction, the Church Age, the Rapture, the Tribulation. Tribulation is followed by the Second Coming. That's chapter 19, we did that last week. And here we are, chapter 20, the kingdom age. And we're going to look at this, at the kingdom itself extensively, and then get into the actual chapter, uh, 20th chapter of, of Revelation. Now, we're in the outline, the, the outline of the book of Revelation, uh, what we call the kingdom is known as the millennium. And millennium means a thousand years. And notice that as we read, six different times, and you might want to underline them as we read, six different times we have a phrase, the thousand years. Now that thousand years is the millennium, thousand year period, okay? Starting with verse one, and I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand, and he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. So when this starts, Satan is put in the bottomless pit for a thousand years. Verse 3, And cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more. Now it's not a period after more. No more, comma, till. Till what? till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And then what's going to happen? It says, after that, he must be loosed a little season. So this is not the doom of Satan when he goes into the bottomless pit. He's going to be imprisoned for a thousand years. And for 1,000 years, this world will have no devil, no tempter. For a thousand years, the human race will not be able to say, the devil made me do it. The devil will be incarcerated. And so, um, you know, we have the three enemies of the flesh, the world, the flesh, and the devil. And uh, this old flesh is the, is the worst enemy we have, far worse than Satan. And the flesh will still be, will still be with us. So um, there will be a lot of people on the earth that are not Christians at that time, not believers. And uh, so there will still be sin, but it won't be... Uh, as we know it today, because Jesus will be on the throne. He'll be ruling with a rod of iron, and uh, it'll be the government of God here on earth. All right, let's continue on. Verse 4, And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God. They're going to be apparently using axes or guillotines in the tribulation period to wipe out God's people. Many will be beheaded. And uh, who goes around beheading people today? We have the Muslim world. That's, that's a practice in the Muslim world. And so I don't know if this will be involving them or not. And it says that uh, they were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. There's the next time we read about the thousand years. Verse 5, but the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is going to be the great uh, second resurrection that the Bible talks about. We'll be talking about, uh, I'm sorry, the first resurrection. We'll be talking about the two resurrections. And verse 5 says, this is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him. And here it is again, a thousand years. Verse 7, when the thousand years are expired, 
Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Okay, we're going to begin with the kingdom itself and then get into the content of Revelation uh, uh, Revelation chapter uh, 20 here. First of all, to, to help you to understand, the kingdom of God is eternal. Now when we say the kingdom, we're talking about the earthly kingdom, the earthly reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. His kingdom is eternal. Look at Isaiah 9, 6 there on your note sheet. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. So it's eternal. Then it goes on and says, Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. Twice in that verse it, we read that the, his Jesus' kingdom is eternal. It is forever. Well, you say, if it's forever, what is the thousand years then? We just read six different times about the thousand years. Well, the kingdom age is a thousand years. That takes place in time, in the realm of time. The kingdom itself, though it begins in time and extends for a thousand years, when the thousand years expire, the kingdom goes right on, but it will be in eternity where there is no time. And so... The thousand years are this period that we're reading about here in Revelation chapter 20. But the actual kingdom is forever and ever and ever. So um, what, what is so important about the thousand years then? Well, this is just simply the time where Satan is being held in prison, his incarceration. He's in the bottomless pit, not the lake of fire, the bottomless pit, for a thousand years and that will be give man a chance once again to prove that he is a total complete and colossal failure and needs God in every asset, uh, uh, facet of our life. Now the kingdom age is the last and final dispensation and uh, we're talking here about when we say the kingdom age we're talking about the thousand years. This is the final dispensation. There's seven dispensations taught in the Bible. There's the age of innocence that was with Adam in the Garden of Eden. There was the age of conscience that was with Noah. There was the age of human government that was the, uh, uh, began at the Tower of Babel. Then there was the age of promise that began with Abraham. Then there was the age of law that came with Moses. And then there is the age of grace that came with the Apostle Paul. But now we come to the final dispensation. We're living in the age of grace now, by the way. Uh, we come to the final dispensation, the kingdom age or the millennium, and the key figure here is not Paul, not Moses, not Abraham, but the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Now, in every one of these seven dispensations, there are five things that, that run right through all of them. Every single one of them. Number one, man is given responsibility. Number two, man fails that responsibility. Number three, God extends his grace and mercy to mankind. Number four, in every dispensation, God comes down to earth. And in number five, the age ends with man of failure and it ends in judgment. Now the thousand years are no exception. There's going to be a thousand years of peace on earth with Jesus on the throne ruling the nations. And when this age ends, a thousand years are up. There's going to be, uh, once again, man is going to be proofs that he is a failure and the age is going to end in judgment. And then that will be the final dispensation and then eternity begins, which we will see next week, chapter 21 and chapter 22, the new heavens and the new earth. So going to the next page, what is the state of man when the kingdom begins? Well, we read it in many, many, many places in Scripture, but in Isaiah chapter 2, verses 2 through 4, we read, It shall come to pass in the last days. The last days here are the kingdom. 
that the mountains of the Lord's house shall be established at the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills. And notice what it says, now all nations shall flow unto it. This is going to be a worldwide kingdom. Jesus will be ruling from Jerusalem. Israel will be the head nation, but it will be a worldwide kingdom and all nations shall flow unto it. And if you drop down a little farther there, it says, He will teach us His ways and we will walk in His paths. For out of Zion, that's Jerusalem, shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And, the, the, and the, this portion concludes by saying, about the nations, they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. The golden age of peace that man has dreamed about for centuries is finally going to arrive when King Jesus comes back and sets it up. Now man's responsibility during the kingdom age is to worship the king, to worship the king. Zechariah 14 tells us here, it shall come to pass that every one that is left of all the nations, that means after Armageddon is over with, every one that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And in this portion, you look down to the next underlined part, it says, The Lord will smite the heathen that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Heathen there means nations. So, the nations, the people that do not worship God at the feast and keep the Feast of Tabernacles are going to be judged during that kingdom age. So this is not going to be a perfect time like the Garden of Eden was. It's going to be an age of peace. There'll be no devil to tempt people, but it's not going to be a perfect age, not till the thousand years are, are over with. Then look underneath that at Psalm 72, um, this reading portions of that. It's, uh, it says, the kings of Tarshish and of the isles shall bring presents. The kings of Sheba and Sheba shall offer gifts. Yea, all kings shall fall down before him. All nations shall serve him. This is King Jesus that it's talking about. Now in every scripture, I'm sorry, in every dispensation, God comes down to earth and and. Uh, uh, we have an abundance of scripture that bear this out. Um, Jesus prophesied in Matthew 19, 28, it says that uh, Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit on the throne of his glory, that's his earthly throne, that's going to be in Jerusalem, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, he also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. So that will be here on earth. Jesus is God. God comes down to earth. In Luke 132, the angel prophet Gabriel prophesied, He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give him the throne of his father David. Where was David's throne? On earth, in Jerusalem. That will be where Jesus' throne is. And in Revelation eleven fifteen, we read that the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. It's going to be right here on earth, a worldwide kingdom. Now going to the next page, I want to hurry through this kingdom part so we can get into chapter 20. Um, during the millennium, Israel is going to be the head nation. This is going to be a brand new experience for everybody the head nation, and the seat of world government under the Lord Jesus Christ will be Jerusalem. We read in Deuteronomy 28, 13, here's what God tells them as their future here. The Lord shall make thee the head and not the tail, and thou shalt be above, be above only, and thou shalt not be beneath. The Jews have been walked on, stomped on, trampled upon, persecuted, driven from one place to another for thousands of years. But in the kingdom age, they are going to be the head nation. They will be um, above and not beneath. Now we see, as, as we continue our study of the kingdom, first of all, the kingdom was promised. It was promised to Israel. And it goes all the way back to the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis, chapter 49. It says the scepter and kings are ones that carry scepters. So we know this is about a king. The scepter shall not depart from 
Judah. The king is going to come from the tribe of Judah. Nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh comes. Shiloh is another name for Jesus. Until Jesus comes, Jesus will be the king. All right. Then secondly, this, we have the kingdom proclaimed. When Jesus was here upon earth, John the Baptist, Jesus, and Jesus' disciples all proclaimed the kingdom. The gospel message that they preached was the kingdom gospel. John the Baptist said in Matthew 3 there, uh, it says, In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Why did he say that? Because the king was here. All they had to do was accept the king, and they could have had the kingdom. Jesus begins his public ministry in the next chapter, Matthew chapter 4. And in verse 17, it says, From that time Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Just the same message that John the Baptist preached. He is offering himself to the nation Israel as their king. And the 23rd verse of that chapter says, And he went and preaching... Uh, the gospel of the kingdom. This is the kingdom gospel, that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's the good news. The kingdom is at hand, the long-awaited kingdom. And, of course, Israel rejected the king, and so they still don't have their kingdom. Then Jesus taught this same message to his disciples. Matthew chapter 10, verses 5 through 8. These twelve Jesus sent forth, commanding them, saying, Go not in the way of the Gentiles, and into any of the city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and as you go preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. And their divine credentials were given to them, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils, and so forth. So the, the, the kingdom was proclaimed to Israel. Now, when this government does arrive, it's not going to be a liberal government. It'll be anything but. We read in Revelation 12, 5, that he shall rule the nations with a rod of iron. And we read it again in Revelation 19, 15. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. This is going to be a law and order government, but it will be a righteous government. It'll be good government. It'll be the first perfect government that has ever existed here upon the earth. The next page, we see the kingdom presented. In Matthew chapter 21, the official offer of the kingdom is made by Jesus. This is where he comes into Jerusalem. And we read there, uh, it says, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee, meek and sitting upon an ass, and a colt the full of an ass. Now this is a fulfillment of the prophecy, Zechariah 9.9. He comes into Jerusalem, presents himself as king, and the crowd here says, Hosanna to the son of David, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. But unfortunately, this is the same crowd that a week later were hollering, crucify him. In Acts chapter 3, the kingdom is still being offered. Jesus has gone to the cross, died for our sins, rose again, walked the earth for 40 days, and ascended back into heaven. And the kingdom offer is still being proclaimed by Peter here to the nation of Israel. He says, repent, be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. When the times of refreshing, that's the kingdom, the millennium, the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, and what's going to happen? He shall send Jesus Christ, which was before preached unto you, whom the heavens must receive until the times of restitution of all things. And again, that is the millennium, the times of restitution of all things. So it's called the time of refreshing and the time of restitution. And it comes when Jesus, when he sends Jesus. However, the offer was rejected, the final offer in Acts chapter 7 is the final offer there. They rejected it. And so now the kingdom is postponed. And the age of grace begins. And in Romans 11 verse 25, Paul says, Blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become, become in. The fullness of the Gentiles. That's the church age. And in Romans 11 it says, through their fall, talking about the Jews, through their fall, salvation has come 
unto the Gentiles. Now, it was always God's plan to save Gentiles. But God's plan was that the Gentiles should be saved through the Jews. But because their rejection of Christ, Gentiles were being saved and are still being saved in spite of the Jews. The Jews have nothing to do with it because they, as a nation, have still rejected Christ. So this is where the, the church comes in because of the postponing of the kingdom. God's prophetic program was the kingdom, but it had to be postponed. Then we read in Revelation eleven fifteen about the kingdom being procured. This is where the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of God and of Christ, which takes place at his second coming. Now going to the next page, we have the kingdom being preached. And during the tribulation period, the gospel message being preached will be the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You must believe on Jesus, receive him, because the kingdom is at hand. And we're not going to read all this from Matthew 24, but if you remember when we were in Revelation chapter 6, we saw that Matthew 24 was the tribulation period, the opening of the first six seals. Remember that? All the earthquakes, famines, pestilence, and, and so forth. And Jesus wraps that part up by saying, This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. So the, 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 uh, uh, the kingdom is going to be preached during the tribulation period. That will be the, the uh, message preached. Now the church, where does the church come in with all this? The church is not the kingdom. However, when the church is go, it will be raptured or translated, we are going to be translated into the kingdom. We'll be a part of the kingdom. Now the kingdom is strictly Jewish. It's Jesus ruling from Jerusalem, the 12 apostles on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel, Israel the head nation and all of that. But we're going to have a part in it. Colossians 1.13 says, Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. So we'll have a part of that kingdom. The kingdom's not about the church. It's about Israel and the Jews. But we'll have access to it. And at this time, Jesus will assume his rightful place. 1 Timothy 6 uh, tells us he is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords. And for the first time, this world will get good and honest government. Isaiah 9, 6 and 7, the government shall be upon his shoulders. goes on and says, of the increase of the government and peace, there shall be no end. So the good government, perfect government, uh, will be the, the norm here during the millennial kingdom. Now going to the next page, and again we're not going to read all of this. The second coming takes place in chapter 19. That's what we saw last week. And we, notice there in this lengthy passage, Revelation 19, 11 through 16, this passage is all about the return of Christ, He uh, coming on a white horse, in a vesture dipped with blood and so forth. And we read there right at the end, there on his thigh is a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now in the Old Testament, there's 342 verses that talk about Jesus' second coming. And in the New Testament, there are 318 verses that talk about Jesus' second coming. It's the most taught doctrine in the whole Bible. And here we see uh, Jesus coming back in chapter 19, which we, uh, which we saw last week. And he comes and he sets up the kingdom in chapter 20. And man once again proves himself to be a failure. Satan is cast into the bottomless pit. We read that. He's there for a thousand years. So we think everything's going great on earth at that time. But when the thousand years are expired, verse 7, 8, and 9 tells us, when the thousand years are expired, Satan is loosed out of his prison. You say, why would God let Satan out? Well, he had a purpose. So that man could prove himself to be a failure. Every dispensation ends with man a failure. 
And so Satan is let out of the bottomless pit. And notice what it says. He went forth to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth. He finds a whole world of people ready to follow him. That, that's mind-boggling. In fact, we read in this portion that, um, uh, that the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. There's just going to be millions of people here on earth ready to follow Satan as soon as he is let out of the bottomless pit when the thousand years end. You say, where do all these, where do all these people come from? Where, 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 uh, how, how can this be? Well, remember, Jesus is ruling with a rod of iron. All these people are not, are not necessarily saved people. The Bible says, whosoever shall endure unto the end shall be saved, which means you survive the tribulation period, you'll be saved or spared, you'll be a survivor to go on into the millennial kingdom. Not all of those people are going to be believers. And then for the thousand years, there'll be many babies which will be born here upon earth, many of which will not be believers. And so um, Satan is going to find a whole world full of people that will follow him when he is, when he is loosed. And this age is going to end in judgment, just like every other dispensation. In Revelation 20, verse 11 through 15, talks about the great white throne judgment, which we will come to in a couple of minutes. And that's where all the wicked dead are going to be judged. And at this time, God demonstrates his mercy to man. Look at chapter 21, verse 1. I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. God's mercy is extended to man once more, one more time. His grace is extended to man. He destroys heaven and earth and everything in it, but he first of all creates a new heaven and a new earth. Okay, we're almost done with the kingdom here. Revelation chapter 20, verse 10. We read that the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Now, first he was cast into the bottomless pit. That's when the thousand years begin. That's what, what the starting point of the thousand years. He's put into the bottomless pit. The thousand years ending point is when he's let out of the bottomless pit. And he goes out and deceives the nations, and then God takes him, and he casts him into the lake of fire, and that's where, uh, that's where he is um, uh, ba uh, banished to for, for all eternity. Revelation 20, verse 2 and 3 says, He laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years be fulfilled. Then in verse 7 we read, And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. So during that thousand years, man cannot blame Satan for any of his failures. Now the word millennium itself is not found in the Bible, but neither is the word trinity, neither is the word rapture, and there's some other uh, phrases that are, uh, are not found, that, phrases that we use. However, there's a biblical equivalent of all of these phrases. The biblical equivalent of millennium is the thousand years. The biblical uh, equivalent of the Trinity is the Godhead. The biblical equivalent of the rapture is caught up, caught up or caught away. And um, so the doctrine is there. Those are just words we use to describe that doctrine. Now, Paul had a name for this millennial dispensation here. He called it in Ephesians 1.10, the dispensation of the fullness of times when all things are gathered together in Christ. And Jesus' prayer, when he was here on earth, his prayer and the prayer he taught his followers was to pray for the kingdom. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's a prayer for the kingdom. Israel was to pray that prayer, but they rejected the king. And so the thousand years are followed then by the new heavens and the new earth, which is chapter 21 and chapter 22. Now, 
after saying all of that, let's really get into chapter 20 now. And we're going to start out with the two resurrections. Verses 4 and 5 and 6 talk about the first resurrection and the second resurrection. When I was a young Christian, I thought there was just one great general resurrection. But the Bible, both Old Testament and New Testament, tell us that there are two resurrections. Now, in the book of Revelation, it is the, uh, this is referred to as the first resurrection. We have that at the end of verse 5 and the beginning of verse 6. The first resurrection is called by Jesus in John 5, the resurrection of life. In Luke 14, it's called the resurrection of the just. In Philippians 3, it's called the resurrection from the dead. In Hebrews 11.35, it's called a better resurrection. And in Daniel chapter 2, it is called the resurrection of everlasting life. Now, this resurrection is in three parts. The first resurrection is in three sections. First, we have the first fruits. The first fruits of the resurrection. God likens the resurrection unto a crop like a farmer will plant a crop. And the first thing that, that you notice is the first fruits, okay? The Bible says that Jesus is the first fruits of the resurrection. Every man in his own order, but Christ the first fruits. That's 1 Corinthians 15, 23. Now, part of the first fruits of the resurrection are found in Matthew 27. That's where when Jesus rose from the dead, remember it says that many of the Old Testament saints got out of the graves, they rose with him. Those are all part of the first fruits of the resurrection. Then the second part is the harvest itself. And that's in the rest of verse 23 here. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, and then it goes on and says, afterwards they that are Christ's at his coming. Now that's the rapture at his coming for his, for his people. So that's the harvest. That's the, the main body of the harvest. But in every harvest, there is still a third part, which is called the gleanings. And the gleanings are going to be the tribulation saints. Now we read about them in, in the book of Revelation. In chapter 7 and verse 9, we read, After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number of all nations, kindreds, and people, and tongues, so this, this is people from all over the world. They stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. And it, um, John doesn't know who they are, and so he asks who they are. And we read there then in verse, um, uh, verse 13, And one of the elders answered and saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? Well, he doesn't know. He says, I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. It's going to be a multitude saved during the tribulation period. They will be part of the first resurrection. They will be the gleaning, so to speak. So you got the first fruits, the harvest, and then, uh, then the gleaning afterwards. Okay, now the resurrection body that we're going to have. The Bible says a number of things about it. First of all, it, we read in 1 Corinthians 15 that it is incorruptible and immortal. Incorruptible and immortal. 1 Corinthians 15, 15 and 53. Then secondly, we read that this resurrection body is going to be like Jesus' resurrection body. We read that in Philippians 3 and 1 John 3. It says, we shall be fashioned, when we shall see him, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. In Philippians it says, he shall change this vile body fashioned after his glorious body. So we're going to have a resurrection body just like Jesus' resurrection body. Um, another feature of this body is that they apparently will be able to alter features because Jesus did that in his resurrection body. He appeared to Mary after, in, after the resurrection. She didn't know him. He appeared to the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. They didn't know him until he wanted them to know him. And then he showed himself, and they recognized him. So apparently it's going to be quite different from the bodies that we have here. Uh, then these bodies are not subject to space 
and matter. Jesus appears in the midst of the disciples. They're in a locked room. The doors are shut and locked. He comes right through the walls and appears unto them in his resurrection body. And that's where Thomas said to him, uh, you know, I, I want to put my, put my hands in the uh, nail, nail prints of his, of his hands. And so um, uh, apparently this resurrection body is going to, at least in Jesus' case, is going to retain some earthly scars because the nail prints of the hand and the spear wound of the side are still there in his body. That's why in back in chapter 5, when John is brought into the throne room of God, he says, I saw a lamb as it had been slain. That was Jesus. And the marks of the cross are still there in that body. Even though it's a different body, he still bears, bears those marks. So that's what we know about the resurre resurrection body. Now the second resurrection is after the thousand years are ended. That's in verse 7 through 9. That's where, where we read there. And we don't know anything about the, the the resurrection body of the second resurrection. We don't know what it's going to be like. But they're going to be resurrected so that they can be judged according to what they have done here upon the earth. So the failure of man is, is seen here um, in the second resurrection. There's going to be many that are going are going to appear in this set, uh, second resurrection. Now, the final doom of Satan, as we already saw, was in chapter uh, 20, verse 10, Satan's doom in the, in the lake of fire. And there, <laughs> you see the face there? <laughs> Pretty neat the way Mike does, did that. Okay, um, this, is, this is the, um, uh, in Revelation 19, the, the Antichrist, and the false prophet are put into the lake of fire in chapter 19. They're the first two occupants of the lake of fire. Chapter 20, the devil is put into the lake of fire, and that says the beast and the, where the beast and the false prophet are. A thousand years later, they're still there in torment. And a thousand years after that, and a thousand years after that, they will be there for, for all eternity. Okay, now... Um, uh, the, the the next occupants of the lake of fire. Yeah, first you have the beast and the antichrist, a uh, beast and the false prophet, rather. Then, then Satan. He's the third one. And now at the great white throne judgment, we have all the wicked dead. And beginning to read in verse eleven, follow with me. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. The sea gave up the dead which were in it. Death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. They were judged every man according to their works. Death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. Here it is again. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the, into the, the, the lake of fire. Now, um, lost people are judged at this great white throne judgment. This great white throne, that is the place where, uh, the, uh, where they are judged. Believers, on the other hand, are judged at the judgment seat of Christ. That's two different judgments altogether, and it's for two different purposes altogether. We read about the judgment seat of Christ. Uh, we read twice about that. Once is in 2 Corinthians 5.10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. What's the purpose of the judgment seat of Christ? It's to reward God's people. This is where the rewards are handed out at the judgment seat of Christ. We read about it again in Romans chapter 10, uh, 14, I'm sorry. He says, Why dost thou judge thy brother, or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And when we're standing there before the judgment seat of Christ, it says, Every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. Notice, it's the judgment seat of Christ 
but we confess to God, and it goes on and says we shall give an account of himself to God. Jesus is God. It's Jesus' judgment seat, but we, give, we confess to God and give an account to God. So, so Jesus is, is God there. And the, again, the purpose of, the, of this judgment seat of Christ is to reward the believers. However, um, the great white throne judgment is not to reward anybody. It's to determine the degrees of punishment that uh, the lost are, are going to, uh, are going to um, uh, have to endure. And just like there's degrees of rewards at the judgment seat of Christ, there will be degrees of punishment at the great white throne judgment. Now, everybody at the great white throne judgment is lost already. They're not being judged whether they're saved or lost. They're already lost. They wouldn't be there if they weren't lost. This is to determine their punishment. And how does he do that? Well, verse 12 says, The dead, small, and great stand before God, and the books were open. God's got a record book. Every single lost person on the face of the earth, there's a record book that is kept. And then it says another book was opened, which is the book of life. So you got every, every person, lost person, they're going to come up before the great white throne judgment. There's going to be one book over here, which will be the book of life. There'll be another book over here, which will be their own biography, so to speak, of all the things they have or have not done. And that's how they're going to be judged. They're going to be judged from this book over here. But if they say, well, wait a minute, Lord, uh, you know, I, I was religious, I went to church, I did all of this, and God's going to go to the book of life over here, open it up, and if their name is not there, then they're going to be cast into the lake of fire. Now, the great white throne judgment is not to determine the Savior lost, but it's to sentence the lost. Notice this verse, John 3, 18. Jesus said, he that believeth on him is not condemned. You believe on Jesus, there's no condemnation. Romans 8, 1, there's therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. But he that believeth not is condemned already. Why? Because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So every person that has not taken Jesus as their Savior is already condemned. And that this condemnation will reach its apex at the judgment seat of Christ. Now, the book of life that we read about here in verse 12 and 15, we read in Luke chapter 10, Notwithstanding, in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. That would be in the book of life. Your names are written in the book of life. And then in the book of Philippians, Again, we read, I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labored with us in the gospel, with Clement also, and with others, my fellow laborers, whose names are in the book of life. Those are the believers, the fellow laborers of Paul. And then in Revelation chapter um, uh, 3, he that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. Then we read again in Revelation chapter 13, and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And in Revelation chapter 17, the beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition, and they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. That's when your name is put in, in the book of life, from the foundation of the world. Back before creation ever took place, God knew who was going to be saved, and he put their names in the book of life. Okay, and then, uh, then also, finally, uh, Revelation chapter 21 we read, and there shall be in no wise enter in into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. And then finally, in chapter 22, if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, in other words, tamper with the Bible, 
God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things that are, which are written in this book. So the book of life is, is the, final, uh, the final decree, so to speak. Anyone's name not in that book is going to be cast into the lake of fire. Now, the, the scripture says here that they're judged according to their works. Now, we're not judged by works. Uh, we're not saved by works. But these are already lost. And the judgment of the works is to determine the degree of torment in the lake of fire. Now, we have, um, if you turn, please, to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. We have two um, examples by the Lord Jesus about the different degrees of punishment to those that reject him. Matthew chapter 10, verse 14 and 15 is the first one. Well, we'll read verse 15. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Now he's talking here about a couple of cities that existed back at that time, um, uh, Chorazin and Bethsaida. He says it will be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, that was one of the most wicked places on earth. But Sodom and Gomorrah, all they had, the only light that they had was a backslidden old believer named Lot. And uh, so their judgment is not going to be as bad as Chorazin and Bethsaida, who had the Lord Jesus personally there with them. Now go to the next chapter, chapter 11. And in, pardon me, starting with verse 20. Then he began to upbraid the cities wherein most of his mighty works were done, because they repented not. Verse 21, Woe unto thee, Chorazin! Woe unto thee, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon. Tyre and Sidon were two cities that God destroyed, Back in the Old Testament times, uh, he raised up Nebuchadnezzar to do that. He says, if the mighty works which had been done in Chorazin and Bethsaida, Bethsaida had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment. That's at the great white throne judgment. That's concerning the lake of fire. It's just be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon, they're going to go into the lake of fire because they rejected the Lord, but it's not going to be as bad for them as it is for uh, uh, Chorazin and Bethsaida. And then verse 23, he says, And thou Capernaum, there's another city, which art exalted unto heaven, he says, shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty deeds which had been done in thee had been done in Sodom, here we're back to Sodom again, it would have remained until this day, but I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee. So there will be degrees of punishment at the great white throne judgment, determining how much punishment uh, a, a person is, uh, is going to receive. Now, if you just jump ahead, go back to Revelation again, and if you just jump ahead to chapter 21 and verse 8, chapter 21, verse 8, it says, The fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. They each will have their part. There will be a part of the lake of fire for liars. There will be a part of the lake of fire for murderers. It will be a part of the lake of fire for child abusers and pornographers and sodomites and, and so forth. Each one will have their part. Some sweet little old lady that goes through life helping others and doing good and so forth, but never accepts Jesus Christ as her personal Savior, she's going to die lost and go to the lake of fire. Adolf Hitler, who murdered millions and millions of people, is going to uh, go to the lake of fire. But it'll be far worse for Hitler than that sweet little old lady that never received Jesus as her Savior. There's degrees of punishment 
in the lake of fire, just as there are degrees of reward at the judgment seat of Christ. So those are the two judgments. Okay, the, um, uh, the way to, to, to think about this is hell is the county jail. You know, when somebody gets arrested, they take them and lock them up in the county jail. Okay, that's what hell is. It's the county jail. And then the, ta the person is taken from the jail into court. And that's where he has his trial. And in the court, if he's found guilty, sentence is passed on him. And he's taken, but he, he's not taken back to the county jail. He's taken to the penitentiary. Well, the lake of fire is God's penitentiary. The great white throne judgment is God's courtroom. And hell is the county jail where the prisoner is held. Every lost person that dies goes to hell and will remain in hell until the great white throne judgment. And then they'll be taken from the uh, county jail, hell. They're going to stand before God at the great white throne judgment, judged according to their works, and sentenced to their part in the lake of fire. And we read there that the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death, death which claims the body, and hell which claims the soul, body and soul reunited. That's the second resurrection, re reuniting a body and soul. Death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And so this ends the thousand years. It ends with man once again proving himself to be a failure and then the uh, passing away of time, ending of time, and chapter 21 and 22 is the new heavens and, and the new earth. Um, so next week, chapters 21 and 22, the new heavens and the new earth. Time ends and eternity begins. Well, that takes us through the kingdom and the final judgment and so forth. And we'll have just that one more week now, uh, next week, chapter 21 and 22. That brings us to the end of the book of Revelation. Let's have prayer together and we'll be dismissed. Thank you now, Heavenly Father, for the Word of God that outlines for us the whole program of God from the creation of man to, to the eternal kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, we're so thankful that we can say we know Jesus as our Savior and we've passed from death unto life and we know that we've been born again by the witness of the Spirit within us. And thank you so much, Lord Jesus, for going to the cross, dying for our sins and saving us both from that awful hell and even worse, the lake of fire. And so, Lord, we just praise you and worship you and we love you tonight for all that you've done for us. Dismiss us with your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen.